Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the Scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for May 31st through June 6th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 60 through 62. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the Scriptures. Hello, Scriptures! Yay! So good to have them. And now let's consult the Scripture Medic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 14 minutes, 24 seconds. And what would that be daily? 2 minutes, 3 seconds. Fantastic. That is so doable. And if you want to study with us section by section, we've got some time codes you can jump to or just hang on and we'll talk about it all together all at once. Either way is great. So buckle up. Let's take a look at sections 60 through 62. Now, these sections were revealed very close together. The first one started on October 8, 1831. Joseph Smith and several elders prepared to leave Independence, Missouri and return to Ohio. The Lord instructed the elders to preach the gospel as they traveled. This instruction is what is now recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 60. But on the third day of their journey, the company experienced danger on the Missouri River. The next two days, August 12th and 13th, the prophet Joseph Smith received two revelations from the Lord. Those revelations are now recorded in section 61 and 62, and they include words of instruction, warning, comfort, and encouragement. But let's jump into section 60. Starting in verse 1, Behold, thus saith the Lord unto the elders of his church, who are to return speedily to the land from whence they came. Behold, it pleaseth me that you have come up hither. But with some I am not well pleased, for they will not open their mouths, but they hide the talent which I have given unto them, because of the fear of man. Woe unto such, for mine anger is kindled against them. Now, that might seem interesting to you, especially if you remember our discussion of Doctrine and Covenants section 33. There... There was a revelation to Ezra Thayer and Northrop Sweet in which repeatedly the Lord gave them the admonition to open their mouths. It's very important that we have the opportunity to open our mouths and share what we know with our brothers and sisters. And the Lord is not pleased with us when we don't. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that in our modern era, we have a lot more methods to open our mouths. It's not just about speaking to those that we might be face-to-face with. That's very true. Communications technology has really blossomed in the last century in particular. There's a quote that I found in the Institute Manual from then-President Dieter F. Uchtdorf. This comes from April 2011 General Conference, where he says, quote, My dear young friends, perhaps the Lord's encouragement to open your mouths might today include use your hands to blog and text message the gospel to all the world. But please remember, all at the right time and at the right place. With the blessings of modern technology, we can express gratitude and joy about God's great plan for his children in a way that can be heard not only around our workplace, but around the world. Sometimes a single phrase of testimony can set events in motion that affect someone's life for eternity. The most effective way to preach the gospel is through example. If we live according to our beliefs, people will notice. If the countenance of Jesus Christ shines in our lives, if we are joyful and at peace with the world, people will want to know why. One of the greatest sermons ever pronounced on missionary work is this simple thought attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words, end quote. That is so good. Such an important message. I wanted to just point something out that really struck me in the middle of the quote here. Sometimes a single phrase of testimony can set events in motion that affect someone's life for eternity. I testify that that is true. Someone very dear to me in my life has had that experience where it was a missionary who wasn't even speaking to her, just walking by, and she overheard 
this sincere, enthusiastic statement. He said, oh man, I love this work. That's it. And it set things in motion that changed the course of her life, my life. It's incredible what we can do if we just open our mouth and share our enthusiasm for this great work. It's true. And some of us might feel a little overwhelmed by the need to be able to say some profound spiritual thing all the time because somebody might be listening and this might affect their lives forever. Well, that part of it is not up to us. Notice the words in Jay's example. It was a very simple sentence, very simple words, but it was the power of the Spirit that pierced the person hearing it and changed their lives. That's what actually does the work. Right. So remember, when we think of the miraculous power of God in this work, our job isn't to feed the 5,000. God will do that. Our job is to bring the loaves and bring the fishes. And the Lord can do incredible things with that. I know that's true. But what can happen if we don't share what's been given to us? In verse 3, it says, And it shall come to pass that if they are not more faithful unto me, it shall be taken away, even that which they have. Our testimony is tied to how we share it. And if this discussion seems a little familiar to you, remember the parable of the talents in the New Testament. And it's referenced directly here in the verses, verse 2 specifically. Right. This is the application of that parable. Yeah, we've been given a precious gift. Make sure we share it. Well, going on in verses 5 through 9, there are instructions for those who are leaving for Ohio. Verse 5, they can make or buy a craft boat to travel to St. Louis. From there, Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Oliver Cowdery should travel to Cincinnati to preach in verse 6. Verse 7 And in this place, let them lift up their voice and declare my word with loud voices, without wrath or doubting, lifting up holy hands upon them. For I am able to make you holy, and your sins are forgiven you. That is a very profound promise. I really enjoy that. It sure is. And then in verses 8 and 9, others split up in pairs to preach on your way back to Ohio and to take your time. Now, verses 12 through 17, we have instructions for those coming to Jackson County. In verse 13, thou shalt not idle away thy time, neither shalt thou bury thy talent, that it may not be known. Again, in reference to that parable. Right. It's in reference to the first part of the revelation, but also the specific instruction, thou shalt not idle away thy time. From the Institute Manual, I found a great quote from Elder M. Russell Ballard. This comes from an Enzyme article in July 2004 called Be Strong in the Lord. He says, quote, One of the ways Satan lessens your effectiveness and weakens your spiritual strength is by encouraging you to spend large blocks of your time doing things that matter very little. I speak of such things as sitting for hours on end, watching television or videos, playing video games night in and night out, surfing the internet, or devoting huge blocks of time to sports, games, or other recreational activities. Don't misunderstand me. Games, sports, recreational activities, and even television can be relaxing and rejuvenating, especially in times when you are under stress or heavily scheduled. You need activities that help you to unwind and rest your minds. But I speak of letting things get out of balance. One devastating effect of idling away our time is that it deflects us from focusing on the things that matter most. Too many people are willing to sit back and let life just happen to them. It takes time to develop the attributes that will help you to be a well-balanced person. So focus the best you can on those things in life that will lead you back to the presence of God, keeping all things in their proper balance, end quote. Some important advice. Great counsel. So going on in verse 14, the gospel should be proclaimed among the congregations of the wicked, not in haste, neither in wrath nor with strife. And then in 15, careful instructions 
to shake off the dust of thy feet against those who receive, not in their presence, lest thou provoke them, but in secret, and wash thy feet as a testimony against them in the day of judgment. And that brings us to section 61. Welcome to 61. I'm happy to be here. On August 9th, 1831, the Prophet Joseph Smith and 10 elders departed Independence, Missouri in canoes, heading down the Missouri River for St. Louis. The river was difficult to navigate due to the many fallen trees submerged in the river. During the first few days of traveling, there was some conflict that arose in the group and feelings of discord were present for a time. On the third day of the journey, a submerged tree nearly capsized the canoe that Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon were in. At the prophet's urging, the group camped on the banks of the Missouri River at a place called McIlwain's Bend. After leaving the river to make camp, William W. Phelps saw in broad daylight the destroyer in his most horrible power ride upon the face of the waters. That evening, the group discussed their difficulties resolved their contentious feelings, and forgave one another. The next morning, the prophet received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 61. So let's look at that revelation. Let's start in verse 3. But verily I say unto you that it is not needful for this whole company of mine elders to be moving swiftly upon the waters, whilst the inhabitants on either side are perishing in unbelief. Now, that's interesting. Yeah. So the instruction is not so much about avoiding the waters, but so much about paying attention to the people around them on the path, on the journey. Right. It's important to the Lord that they take the time to open their mouths wherever they go. Right. And that there are people on either sides of the river that are perishing in unbelief. Yeah. From the Institute Manual, there's a quote from President Thomas S. Monson. This is from the October 2009 General Conference where he says, quote, How many times has your heart been touched as you have witnessed the need of another? How often have you intended to be the one to help? And yet, how often has day-to-day living interfered and you've left it for others to help? Feeling that, oh, surely someone will take care of that need. We become so caught up in the busyness of our lives. Were we to step back, however, and to take a good look at what we're doing, we may find that we have immersed ourselves in the thick of thin things. In other words, too often we spend most of our time taking care of the things which do not really matter much at all in the grand scheme of things, neglecting those more important causes." End quote. It's a great reminder of something similar that Elder Oaks has taught, and it's been restated many times about good, better, and best. Right. Heading down the river swiftly to get home, and I'm sure they were anxious to get home. That's good. But the Lord lets them know that there's something even better or best that they could be doing. As Elder Holland reminded us recently, do you want what you want, or do you want something better? So good. So good. So coming up in these verses, verse 5, 14 through 19, the Lord taught that many destructions would occur on the waters in the last days. Let's take a look at verse 6 here. He says, Nevertheless, all flesh is in mine hand, and he that is faithful among you shall not perish by the waters. No matter what the dangers are coming up in the last days, whether upon the waters or wherever, all flesh is in the Lord's hands. Our job is to stay close to him. Now, the Institute Manual has a comment here. It says, at the time of this revelation, the dangers of the Missouri River included accidents due to difficulties in navigating the waters and contracting cholera, a disease most commonly spread by contaminated water. In verses 7 through 8, The Lord says, Wherefore it is expedient that my servant Sidney Gilbert and my servant William W. Phelps be in haste upon their errand and mission. Nevertheless, I would not suffer that ye should part until you were chastened for all your sins, that you might be one, that you might not perish in wickedness. Notice the purpose of for the chastisement before they depart on their mission, so that they might be reconciled 
with one another, that they might be one so that they wouldn't perish in wickedness. We know where that disharmony can lead. So in other words, it's time for Sidney and William to go, but first, you need to be rebuked. Right. But skipping down to verse 22, we get some more instruction to these missionaries. Sidney and William, if you want to travel by land or by water, use your best judgment. That's in verse 22. But Joseph and Oliver and Sidney don't travel by water except the canal. Now, people coming to Zion should not travel by water after crossing the canal. They should come by land as the ancient Israelites pitching their tents by the way in verse 25. That's a nice image. It is. And it's interesting. There are some members of the church that look at this as, you know, oh, well, it's all about the water being destructive and the destroyer riding on the face of it. But let's not lose sight of some of the things that the Lord is pointing out. What is the reason why he wants the people to travel? Well, he wants them to travel by land, pitching their tents by the way. Perhaps that is symbolic. Perhaps that is something that would cause them to focus more of their energy as they are approaching Zion on what this means. Well, and it's interesting, too, that obviously the Lord knows the path. This is still wilderness travel, and the Lord wants to give them the best chance to be successful. And right. So he has instructions. Well, and also, as we've been pointing out with the missionaries, it's less about traveling on the water because as he gave instruction to Sidney and William, if you want to travel by water, eh, use your best judgment. But with Joseph and Sidney and Oliver, don't travel by water. Why? He has some work for them to do. There are some things that they need to do along the land, people that they need to meet and preach to. Not too many people to preach to in the river. That's true. They'll miss that opportunity if they travel too swiftly. But as we come to the end of this revelation, I want to include some verses that give some very strong encouragement. In verse 20, let's go back to verse 20. It says, I, the Lord, was angry with you yesterday, but today mine anger is turned away. So that's good. That's encouraging. We're making progress. Skipping down to verse 36. And now verily I say unto you that what I say unto one, I say unto all. Be of good cheer, little children, for I am in your midst, and I have not forsaken you. And inasmuch as you have humbled yourselves before me, the blessings of the kingdom are yours." Gird up your loins and be watchful and be sober, looking forth for the coming of the Son of Man. For he cometh in an hour you think not. Pray always that you enter not into temptation, that you may abide the day of his coming, whether in life or in death. Even so, amen. Wonderful. Great promise, great encouragement. Let's take a look at section 62 then. Similar setting to what we just were reading. On August 13th, 1831, the prophet Joseph Smith and the elders traveling with him to Kirtland, Ohio, met Hiram Smith, John Murdoch, Harvey Whitlock, and David Whitmer at Cheriton, Missouri. These elders had not yet reached Independence, Missouri, partly because they had been preaching the gospel along the way and partly because John Murdoch's illness delayed travel. Joseph Smith later recounted that after the joyful salutations with which brethren meet each other, he received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 62. So let's take a look at that section, starting in verse 1. Behold and hearken, O ye elders of my church, saith the Lord your God, even Jesus Christ your advocate, who knoweth the weakness of man, and how to succor them who are tempted. And verily mine eyes are upon those who have not as yet gone up unto the land of Zion, wherefore your mission is not yet full. Nevertheless, ye are blessed, for the testimony which ye have borne is recorded in heaven for the angels to look upon, and they rejoice over you, and your sins are forgiven you. Now continue your journey, assemble yourselves upon the land of Zion, and hold a meeting, and rejoice together, and offer a sacrament unto the Most High, and then you may return to bear record, yea, even all together, or two by two, as seemeth you good. It mattereth not unto me. Only be faithful and declare glad tidings unto the inhabitants of the earth or among the congregations of the wicked. Behold, I, the Lord, have brought you together that the promise might be fulfilled, that the faithful among you 
should be preserved and rejoice together in the land of Missouri. I, the Lord, promise the faithful and cannot lie. I, the Lord, am willing. If any among you desire to ride upon horses or upon mules or in chariots, he shall receive this blessing. If he receive it from the hand of the Lord with a thankful heart in all things. Now, there's some interesting things that we see in these three sections. There are careful instructions. There are promises for fulfilling those instructions. But there are also decisions that the Lord gives. Notice the different ways that the Lord taught this group about what was important to him and when they could be making decisions for themselves. Let's review. Back in section 60, verse 5, what is it that matters in that verse? Well, that the elders take their journey speedily to St. Louis. But what doesn't matter to the Lord? Whether the elders made or bought a craft to travel in. That's a choice they can make for themselves. And what about in section 61? We looked at 21-22, that the elders take their journey in haste, that they fill their mission. That's what matters to the Lord. What doesn't matter? Well, whether they travel by water or by land. And then in these verses we just read in section 62, verses 5, 6, and 7, what matters? Well, that the elders be faithful, bear testimony of the gospel, and help the saints gather. But what doesn't matter? Well, whether the elders journeyed all together or two by two, whether they rode horses or mules or in chariots, it's important to remember that we have a mind and the Lord expects us to use it. There are many good choices and decisions that we can make. The Lord will let us know what is most important to him, but there is so much that he expects us to figure out on our own. From the Institute Manual, there's a message from then-Elder Dallin H. Oaks from an Enzyme article in October 1994 called Our Strengths Can Become Our Downfall, where he expands on this very thing. He says, quote, A desire to be led by the Lord is a strength, but it needs to be accompanied by an understanding that our Heavenly Father leaves many decisions for our personal choices. Personal decision-making is one of the sources of the growth we are meant to experience in mortality. We should study things out in our minds, using the reasoning powers our Creator has placed within us. Then we should pray for guidance and act upon it if we receive it. If we do not receive guidance, we should act upon our best judgment. End quote. That's very encouraging. It is. And maybe a little intimidating. Yes, it is. But it shows us what trust our Father in Heaven has in us. Notice Elder Oaks's comment in that quote. If we receive guidance, we need to act on it. If we don't receive guidance, we still need to act, but use our best judgment. That's that trust. Our Father in Heaven knows when we will need to do something that is critical to His function and when we can go about it in many different ways, and how we get there is really not important. There's a wonderful quote from Elder Richard G. Scott in a devotional he did at BYU called Truth. He says, what do you do when you don't feel an answer? You know, if you're praying and asking for guidance from the Lord and you don't feel an answer, he says, I've come to thank the Lord with all my heart when that occurs, for it is an evidence of his trust. Yeah, exactly. That is a very powerful manifestation of our Heavenly Father's trust in us. And we need to live up to that. Yeah, how wonderful for him to trust us. He knows us. And what a great opportunity for us to think about that, the choices that are ours. May we deserve the trust that we're given and seek well to do what the Lord wants us to do. And that can include studying our scriptures. And let's do that this coming week. We've got an opportunity to continue our study in the Doctrine and Covenants. Let's take that time and make sure that we're looking for gems, things that the Spirit uses to speak to us personally. Yep, and we'll talk to you more about those in our next lesson. Sounds great. We'll look forward to seeing you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>